so great to be with you guys. Seriously, if you have a Bible, let's go to Luke chapter 18 this morning. Uh, it is a delight, and I'm not going to look at myself. I'm going to stand right here. Yeah. Um, uh, Todd didn't mention the calendar that I have out, um, 12 months of Mike Erie. I've got, uh, got some photo shots. I did it. Uh, what's that place called? Beauty Shots? What is that called? Glamour Shots. So, so you may want to you may want to check that out. Like February is just me in a big bow, and it's pretty exciting. Um, you're going really? No. Uh, Luke chapter 18. So I've been I've been a, a teacher uh, and a preacher for about 15 years. I started when I was 10. So if you do the math on that, you can figure out uh, how old I am. And um, and one of the things that I'm continually shocked by, particularly as I talk to people who do this is the temptation to make Jesus attractive. It's the, it, it, and, and of course he's attractive, and I'd say of course he's attractive you know, on his own, he doesn't need me, but, but every time I stand up and talk to people, particularly if I don't know them, uh, if it's like at an Easter service or a Christmas Eve service or a, a setting like this, I always, I, and, and for 15 years I felt this way, I've always, I always feel this pressure to kind of make Jesus look good. And I, and I think that just doesn't infect my heart. I think that affects uh, many of our churches too. You know, I, I read about churches that if you come on Easter, you get a free car, or you could win a free car, or free iPods, or, and, and there's part of that that I think's good. You know, Paul talks about making the gospel attractive to people, and, and okay, but as I read and study the ministry of Jesus, the last thing he seemed to do was to bribe people or beg people into his movement, would you agree? I mean, in fact, when his popularity was soaring, he'd offer a hard teaching, right? And then have to look at his 12 closest followers and say, well, are you leaving too? I mean, Jesus ignored the, the, uh, the, the focus groups and the popularity polls. Jesus had, was just totally free from the idea that somehow he needed to beg or bribe people into his movement, and yet, for me, and I think for many of us, and in many of our churches, we suffer from this idea that somehow Jesus isn't enough. We've gotta jazz him up a little bit. We've gotta, it's Jesus and some steak knives. You know, it's Jesus and it's, it's, it's health and wealth. It's Jesus and then you're not gonna have any problems. It's Jesus and then you're gonna be happy forever. And, 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 and when you look at Jesus, I mean, he just, he wasn't going around begging people, right? He comes into Jerusalem. And, uh, and his disciples are making a lot of noise. And the religious leaders look at him and say, you know, could you please shut them up? And what's he say? Well, if they shut up, then the rocks will cry out. Right? Our Jesus isn't a Jesus hurting for worship. He's not a Jesus who's lonely or who's insecure. He's a Jesus that comes and he invites. But for people that had other things going, he let them walk away. He didn't bribe them, he didn't coerce them, he didn't manipulate them. And I wanna look at a posture of the heart this morning that when Jesus saw it, he loved it. Now he loves all postures of heart, right? He, he doesn't matter where you are, he still loves you. But there's something we've lost in American Christianity that I think needs to be recaptured. And if I'm gonna get one shot to speak to you guys you know, in a year, I, I would wanna talk about this. It's the thing that God's been teaching me. So Luke chapter 18. We'll go, uh, we'll start in verse 35. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And by the way, that's a great roadside to beg on. Lots of, uh, lots of the rich uh, folks had summer homes in Jericho, so you'd travel this road a lot. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. So he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. And one of my favorite lines in all the New Testament, but he shouted all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought near. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see. Have you ever been around somebody 
who isn't so interested in the polished Christian veneer? Have you ever been around somebody, maybe in a recovery movement? Have you ever been, in, have you ever been around somebody who's like so broken and so empty and so at the end of themselves, they really don't care what anyone else is thinking? Right, this is this guy. You got the big parade coming down, he yells out to Jesus, they tell him to be quiet, so what's he do? He yells louder. Jesus seemed to kind of compel this sort of behavior, right? You don't like weave your way through a crowd of people if you're religiously unclean because of a bleeding issue to touch the hem of his robe unless you're desperate. You don't dig a hole through a roof and let your friend down through the hole to be in front of Jesus unless you're desperate. I think that much of modern Christianity is designed to keep us from that sort of sloppiness, that sort of messiness. I mean, I wonder if in our church services, if somebody walked in and they didn't know the protocol, they didn't know when to stand and when to sit and when to say amen and when to be quiet, and they just announced they were 20 hours sober and they needed help. How many of our churches would just be like those leading the parade in this instance that would tell the man, be quiet. I'm convinced that Jesus does some of his best work when we're at the end of our rope. Dallas Willard has this great line, if you wanna know God's address, it's at the end of your rope. Right, whenever you come to the end of yourself, Jesus does some of his best work. And that doesn't mean he likes whatever took you there or that he was behind whatever brought you into desperation, but whenever Jesus of Nazareth found a heart that was desperate, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see. And he heals the man. Go if you would to Luke chapter five. You guys know these stories, of course. But there is a singular lack of desperation to most American Christians, would you agree with that? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize there were like a thousand of my friends here in that moment. It was like me and two people. Would you agree that there is a singular lack of desperation in most of American Christianity? Would you agree? Oh my, hello, Viola, good morning. How many of you just got up right before you came here? Raise your hand, hi. I miss college, bless you, bless you. My two-year-old was up at 5.45 this morning, wanting to play. What do you do? You turn the little monitor off in your room and... <clears throat> Sorry. Luke chapter five, the parenting seminar will be uh, next semester. Um, Luke chapter five, verse 12. Just a couple of stories you know. While Jesus was in one of the towns, verse 12, a man came along who was covered with leprosy, and you guys know leprosy, right? The disease, of course, was brutal. But along with that was the social stigma attached to it. You were literally untouchable. The disease was communicable, so you, had to, you couldn't touch anybody. You were ceremonially unclean, so you couldn't worship. If you had been married, you were now cast out. Adults would spit at you. Children would throw rocks at you. You had to announce your presence within 100 feet of anybody else by shouting unclean, unclean. People would scatter when they saw you coming. You were untouchable, unredeemable. There was just nothing to do for you except cast you out to be with others of your own kind. So when somebody who comes to Jesus who, who has leprosy, I mean, again, a person at the end of the rope, he says, when he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him, now, I don't know about you, but face down normally isn't my posture of prayer, right? I like to sit very comfortably, and I like to pray like I'm ordering off a menu, right? I'd like, I'd like a little, I'd like a little, like, can you help me on this test? Um, I'd like a little bit of health. How about a double portion of blessing? Um, and hold the trials and temptations, if you would, right? It's like, wait, it's just like this, this, this transaction. There's no, I mean, there's no begging. I mean, the only time I've really begged was when I asked my wife to marry me and that, you know, and there was some bribing involved in that, you know, for sure. So this dude comes and you're, and, and some of you are thinking, why would you have to beg Mike? And I agree, I don't know, but she was like hard to get. I don't, I don't get it. 
And so when he saw Jesus, he fell face down and he begged the man, Lord, if you are willing, you can hear the brokenness in his request, if you are willing, you can make me what? Clean. Not just healed, but restored to the community. It's not clean and unclean, you guys know, had nothing to do with hygiene. It had everything to do with your fitness to worship and be a part of the community. And so somebody like this, totally at the end of their rope, comes to Jesus and begs, not just for the physical removal of the disease, but also the stigma attached to it. And here's what I love about Jesus. Jesus reached out his hand and what? Touched the man. Now, brothers and sisters, you just read that in English and you go, oh, well, that's nice. It's a cool flannel graph story, you know? I mean, Jesus touching the leper, this is a big deal. Back then, right, you guys know this, it was thought that unclean infects clean. If clean and unclean ever came into contact, unclean won. So the way to stay clean was to avoid anything unclean. The way to stay pure was to avoid anything impure. And we know from other healing stories that Jesus can heal long distance. He doesn't have to touch anybody, right? He could just say the word. So his touching of the man is significant and intentional. And the reason is, in this instance and in all others, Jesus, unlike anybody else of his day, his purity overrides any impurity he comes in contact with. This was revolutionary, guys. Because it was thought unclean infects clean, and here comes Jesus, so pure, so holy, so majestic, that he wins over whatever disease, whatever stigma, whatever sin he comes into contact with. So he reaches out his hand, and he touches the man, and he says what? I am willing. Now do you think, I don't look at Jesus that way. I don't look at Jesus as somebody who looks at me in my desperation and says, I'm willing. I feel like I gotta negotiate, like a collective bargaining, right? So Jesus, I'm gonna promise I'm never gonna do that again if you. Or Jesus, I'm really gonna work on this if you. Or Jesus, I'm gonna now like, go to church again and read the Bible again if you would. See, when Jesus came in contact with people who had nothing else going, this wasn't a bad thing. What do you want me to do for you? He reached out his hand and he touched the man. But when Jesus came into contact with folks who had other things going, it was just like, oh, okay. Do your other things. Go to Luke chapter nine. How am I doing, Mr. Camera Operator? Am I doing all right? That's right, I'm a gazelle. You gotta. Luke chapter nine, verse 57. As they, you guys there? You guys doing all right? As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Sounds like a pretty good deal to me, right? If I'm looking for followers, I'm taking that offer. Jesus replies with the ever warm and affirming, foxes have dens and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. In other words, you think the journey's gonna be one of glory, I'm telling you the journey's gonna be one of deprivation and ultimately humiliation, okay? Another man, to another man, Jesus said, follow me. Now we've been reading in Luke's account about people that would just drop their nets and follow, this man says, Lord, first let me go bury my father. And in English, it sounds like the guy's got a funeral that day. And so Jesus' ever warm and affirming reply, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God, sounds unusually harsh, right? And, and, and a little background helps, of course. I mean, in Jewish culture, Honor your father and mother was central, and central to honor your father and mother was burying them properly. In fact, burying your mother and father or your relatives was of such significance you were exempted from reciting the Shema that day, or the Amidah, the 18 benedictions, or from wearing tassels that day. Like, it was a huge deal. 
Lots of different ways to understand this verse. My personal opinion is that Jewish burial often was in two steps. Step number one, you'd take the body and you'd put it in a tomb and it would decompose. Take about a year and then you would collect the bones. About a year later, put them in an ossuary, a bone box, and stick them with your ancestors. So my guess is that this dude is somewhere in that year process. And just saying, listen, I have a really important family obligation I have to take care of. To which Jesus replies, your dad's with the corpses, let the corpses take care of it. Would that still be highly offensive to Jewish ears? Oh yes. Still another said, I will follow you Lord, but let me go say goodbye to my family. Jesus replies with the ever warm and affirming. No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for, the, for service in the kingdom of God. Now, there's an Old Testament antecedent to this. Elijah and Elisha. When Elijah calls Elisha into discipleship, Elisha asks to go say goodbye to his family, and Elijah says, sure. If you had your Jewish ears on and you would hear about this encounter, you would see Jesus is saying, discipleship to me is of a higher priority and intensity than discipleship to Elijah. This is just kind of the subtext. But the big point is this. Did Jesus let these folks walk away? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought there was more than just me and the Trinity in this place. Did Jesus just let these folks walk away? I have a friend, I love college students, by the way. I graduated a couple years ago, very excited about that. And, uh, and I love college students because they're just wonderfully intelligent and wonderfully honest. And they haven't learned to pretend a lot. Well, okay, I won't, I won't comment on that. I had a friend who, uh, we were talking through some of this stuff, and he just said, well, listen, here's how I feel. It's more fun not to follow Jesus than to follow Jesus. Right, have you ever thought that? Okay. All right. So like, is anyone looking? Are there cameras around? Yes, right there. <laughs> now, how would you answer somebody like that? They come to you in all honesty and they say, you know what? I, I gotta, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, but it's just more fun to kind of do my own thing for a while and I'll get serious about it later. How do you answer somebody like that? I mean, Jesus didn't beg people do you, do, you, do you beg the guy in? He didn't bribe people. I mean, I don't see bribing in any of this stuff, right? I see just the opposite. And so what I said to the guy, and I don't know if this was a good or bad answer, but I just said, well, it seems like for Jesus, he talked about the cost of following him, but he also talked about the cost of not following him. There's a cost of discipleship and then there's a cost to non-discipleship, right? There's a, of course there's a cost to purity, but there's a cost to immorality. Of course there's a cost to generosity, but there's a cost to greed. Of course there's a cost to humility, but there's a cost to pride. And I said if you give yourself over to rebellion, you actually become formed around the rebellion and, and potentially could be brought to the place where you simply are the kind of person who never wants to go back. I said, but I'm not gonna beg you, and Jesus isn't gonna bribe you, because the reward of following Jesus is Jesus. And until you're convinced of that, not in theology, not in song, but deep to the core of you, that he's the treasure, until you're convinced of that, discipleship feels like a burden. Because if you think there's treasure elsewhere, popularity, success, pleasure, whatever, you look at Jesus and you just try to play the both and game with him. Right, I want a little Jesus sprinkled on my life. I want a little Jesus behind my agenda. And Jesus doesn't do that. When he came across people who were broken and desperate, what do you want me to do for you? I am willing. And we could look at dozens of examples. But when he came across people that just had other options, okay. Have your other options. Because until you're convinced that he's the treasure and that the reward of following Jesus is actually Jesus, 
and that he does some of his best work when you're brought to the place of total desperation. Till you're convinced of those things. Discipleship's a tough thing. My wife and I have three children. Our youngest boy, we found out three months ahead of time, our youngest boy, Seth, had Down syndrome. And we uh, had uh, some, some issues. See, you guys aren't old enough yet to, to, well, maybe you are, to dream about, like, I got married late. I got married at 29. And, um, and, and I hadn't really thought a lot about the kind of family I wanted. I got married, though, and we started having kids, and then I thought a lot about the kind of family I wanted. And those family plans didn't include special needs children. My wife and I found out three months before he was born, we also found out 92% of people abort children with Down syndrome at that place, 92%. My wife and I, I wish we were so godly. I wish we were so godly, we just celebrated. But we went through the whole cycle of grief that you go through when you face disappointments, right? There was some frustration, there was some questions. And I remember soon after he was born, we'd gone to Disneyland. And I think it was like special ed day at the park. Because everywhere we looked were adults with Down syndrome. We were so overwhelmed that we just had to leave. What do you do in those moments? I'm sure some of you have had them. Where it's almost like Peter in John chapter six. Peter goes, well, where else are we gonna go? You alone hold the keys of eternal life, right? I mean, where else are we gonna go? And my wife and I, we've tasted it a number of places, but in that moment of just sheer and utter desperation, you know what we said? Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And we're two years into our journey with this little guy. And I cannot begin to tell you how unbelievable God's grace has been to us. I cannot begin to tell you. I mean, I've not tasted his sufficiency until I was totally at the end of my rope. And I want to suggest, brothers and sisters, that much of American Christianity is designed to keep you from that place. We're taught to pretend in our churches. We're taught to be put together. We're taught to have the right answers instantaneously at the tips of our tongues. We're taught that the last thing we're to be is sloppy or messy or intense enough to dig through a roof or fight through a crowd, or fall face down begging, or when you're told to shut up, you shout all the more. I want to see him that way. So we sing this song, I'm Desperate For You. It's a beautiful song. I can't sing it a lot of times with integrity. Right? I'm desperate for other things. I'm desperate for success, or I'm desperate for a tan, or I'm desperate, you know, for (laughs) other things. But what I can sing is I'm desperate to be desperate. And maybe that's some of you this morning. Maybe you're at a place where things are going sideways. Somebody you love's got a diagnosis, your parents are blowing out, and you feel like it's your fault. Some of you dealing with unbelievable loneliness, depression, anxiety. Maybe you feel totally and utterly at the end of your rope. And maybe a bit of good news this morning is that Jesus does some of his best stuff when you're at that place. He's not always behind what brought you there, and he doesn't love what took you there. But there is a purity and a focus that he will use. And for others of us who are just kind of playing at this whole thing, And I'm one of those. Jesus just comes along and he says, you know, I don't beg anybody. I mean, the rocks will cry out if you won't. 
I'm not a God hurting for worship. I'm not lucky to have you. So I'd like to do this. Would you just close your eyes for a moment and may I pray over you as we close? Father, you in some majestic and mysterious way know right now the hearts of each of your children. Nothing is hidden from you. The best of pretense is useless in your sight. You know, Lord, how hard it is for us to lean in to weakness and to lean in to brokenness and to lean in to insufficiency and desperation. Our world and often our churches tell us that strength is where you're found. And glory is what's to be sought. And Jesus, I pray that you would build into this community a radical willingness to find you in the dark places and in the broken places and in the weak places and at the end of your rope places. Holy Spirit, would you come and would you bless your children? Would you have a word for them out of this that would be life bringing and encouraging? And Jesus, may we see you as the treasure. Amen. Go in grace and peace, brothers and sisters. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.